Welcome this morning to um, the next in the series of the nuclear chapter webinars uh, from the SAIE. Um, we've got we, today the discussion is on uh, the study committee on nuclear nexus of, nex of, uh, of applications, which may sound a bit thing, but it's trying to look at the application of um, nuclear outside the classical domain um, and in the cross. Um, uh, cross, uh, uh, what's what? Um, yeah, cross speciality. Um, I'd like to start out though by reading out the webinar considerations for the members of the people of the webinar. So, um, uh, I'm just going to say that please mute all your mobile phones while the webinar is recording. Okay. Um, so, can I ask you, attendees are reminded to ensure the volume is turned up on their device. Ensure you have a stable internet connection. This will ensure the streaming and audio run smoothly. Attendees can ask questions via the questions panel located within the GoToWebinar control panel. By default, the control panel is located on the right-hand side of your screen. The chat function is reserved for webinar organizers and panelists to communicate with attendees. Attendees will not be able to chat with each other, but are encouraged to ask questions. A recording of the presentation made available on the SAIEE YouTube channel, SAIEE TV, and the recording will also be made available on the SAIEE website under the events drop down menu in the section past events and webinars. This page is updated regularly, so ensure you check back as often as possible for new uploads and subscribe to. To our YouTube channel for more uploads. A certificate of attendance will be issued a few weeks after the webinar once we have received the CPD validation number for this webinar for EXA. So with that administration sorted out, I will now um, start the talk. First of all, I, I'm, I'm acting as the uh, uh, organizer today. I, I'm the chairman of the SAIE's nuclear chapter. And uh, I'm also the chair of, of NEXA, having previously been the um, C chief nuclear officer at ESCOM. And I've done some work internationally in support of the IAEA, which is the UN nuclear body. So with that, I'll go to the first presenter, who is Dr. Uh, Prof Naidu. Um, pardon me, just had a small... Um, Dr. Naidu is a professor of research in the facility of engineering and the built environment at the University of Johannesburg. He is a fellow of the South African Academy of Engineers and a fellow of the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers, a senior member of the IEEE and a member of IET and SIGWE. He is a registered professional engineer and a specialist consultant in electrical energy and power systems. His current research interests are in sustainable development as driven by the green economy and the Industrial Revolution 4.0. Dr. Naidu's, Dr. Naidu's four decade industrial career was with the Electric Supply Commission of, ESC, of South Africa, from engineering training to non executive director. So, with that message, I will now pass across uh, to Professor Naidu to do his talk and present his presentation on the Nexus. So, I'm going across to Professor Naidu now. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, colleagues. Good day and welcome to our session on the nuclear nexus of application. Thank you for joining us in this conversation as we start to deliver our workings in this space of nuclear science, engineering, and technology. Firstly, uh, my reference for, for, for the workings is going to be the United Nations Sustainable Development Agenda 2030, Transforming Our World. And here we see the drive to strengthen the sustainable development goals in, and focus on the nexus of energy, water, waste, health, transport, and food. And uh, as we see, 
there are certain key focus areas that we would intensify. Affordable and clean energy, SDG 7. Climate action, SDG 13. Clean water and sanitation, SDG 6. Decent work and economic growth, SDG 8. Industry, innovation and infrastructure, SDG 9. And for today's talk, I'm going to focus a lot on SDG 8, decent work and economic growth. South Africa yesterday, today and tomorrow. We've got to sharpen the focus. The triple challenge of unemployment, poverty and inequality is with us and it continues to travel with us. And we have to address the challenge that we have on hand. Unemployment. And this is where I want to zoom in. We have unlimited human energy, unlimited youth energy. And when we look at ourselves in Africa, we are endowed with youth. We've got population growth on our side. We've got urbanization. We've also got access to mechanization and automation. When we look at population growth, we look at South Africa today, we are around 60 million. 2050, we're going to be 75 million, turn of the century, 80 million. And a lot of this population is right here with us in Gauteng province. Everyone comes to Gauteng for a job. And when we take look at Gauteng province, this is the economic hub of the country. Recently, we had the independent power producer procurement program. Some 2,000 odd megawatts was purchased. Monetary value, 200 billion. And when we compare the, the amount that was invested and spent in Gauteng province, not one kilowatt, not one. When we look at unemployment, it's currently standing at 30% and it's increasing. We have to do something. So the macro environmental summary that I have on my desk, we've got big numbers, big challenge big demands. We need big help and we need to get lots of lots of help that needs to come forward. When we look at big help, we look back into the industrial revolution era, IR1, IR2 and IR3. We see the drive for mechanization, for mass production. In industrial revolution one, it was water, and steam energy. And again, water and steam energy, steam energy derived from heat. IR2, electrical energy, again, same. Water and again, the heat came from the carbon resources and the uranium resources. Industrial Revolution 3.0, we moved on and added control to electricity. Again, water, carbon and uranium. Now, for each of these revolutions, we find that man got assistance. Man, as in fellow South Africans, got assistance. Assistance from machinery, from technology, from science, from the physics. And that is the assistance we want to talk a little bit about today. When we look at the energy to power all these revolutions, there's only one source of energy. That is the sun. It is the sole source of all energy. And again, when we look at this source of energy, we always find that the sun is ever present. But again, when we talk of sun, we think of renewable energy. And the first question I want to leave with you today, how much renewable energy do you use in daily living? And I'll give you the answer, zero. And again, why? And my view is that we should make hay while the sun shines. We should use as much as we can of renewable energy in our daily living. So, so that is my first reference for myself. When we look at the, the fundamentals, the physics, there's, this, there's the fundamental goal, uh, fundamental number one. Energy is neither created nor destroyed. It's transformed from one form to another. And my understanding of energy is that it's embedded in the periodic table. And you've got the carriers, carbon, uranium, hydrogen. This is all energy for us. And if you look carefully in that periodic table, table, you'll even find lithium. You'll even find lead. They all are there. And my view is that we've got to look carefully as to how best we could employ the energy of the sun as defined by the periodic table. 
Now, firstly, when we look at carbon, let's take the easiest that we all know. There's this upper limit on the sun's carbon energy. The upper limit is coming from the environment, global warming, climate change. And you say it on news every day, the ice is melting. And we have to take steps to arrest this challenge and apply the boundary condition of limiting carbon and shifting away from carbon-based resources. But where do we shift to? And again, we're going to have to shift to possibly uranium, to possibly hydrogen. And later, when we look at energy storage, there's also lithium. So this big help that we talk about and would come from initially uranium, nuclear. That is the heat source that we can employ. It's ideal, it's constant, it's predictable, it's controllable. There's zero environmental emissions. It's a clean source of secure energy. And we have to bring this into our daily applications and in daily living. Uranium creates jobs. When we look at the electricity portfolio, the nuclear reactors, the large reactors, we see very much a sunset industry in the United States, in Germany, in Japan. But we also see simultaneously a sunrise industry, China, Africa. When I say Africa, Egypt's busy with their build program. Kenya is also embarking on their build program. Middle East, the reactors are being commissioned right now in Dubai, United Arab Emirates, and Russia. And again, we see the emergence of the small modular reactor that's going to give us a whole new global industry. And we can play in this space, and we should be playing in this space. Nuclear has got the strength to create and sustain jobs. And when we talk of this, I want us to unpack carefully. The jobs we talk about in the Iranian economy, these are long-term jobs. They contribute to stable economies. It contributes to diverse human activities. And it contributes towards what I term initially in my opening slide, to the nexus of solutions for the various sustainable development goals. It can address issues around water, around waste, around energy. Long-term jobs. In, in nuclear language, this is decades and centuries. This attribute alone delivers to the economy stability and confidence. It's not a job that you can do in a year, in two years. It takes decades. It takes centuries to invest and to sustain this technology. Let's take, for example, South Africa's Kuburg. In 2024, Kuburg would record 40 years of service to the South African national economy. It's going to go on for another 20 years, or 2044. With confidence, it's going to go on. And when we look at Kuburg, it's of 2,000 megawatts. Round figures has given us 2,000 jobs for almost 60 years. And Kuburg's no difference to Kaurabasa. Kaurabasa is the same size, 2,000 megawatts. Also no different to Andrina, same size, 2,000 megawatts. And again, we could do the, the comparisons and we can have a good look at that. And again, at this point, I would like to reflect on the leadership of Dr. Ian McRae. We lost him the other day. And we would like to say thank you to Dr. McRae for having this great visionary of investing in nuclear science, engineering, and technology for South Africa. In a difficult period of the country's evolution, South Africa commissioned Kubak and made a great success of it. Let's build on that success. So the study committee workings is going to focus on this, what I term the nexus of solutions. We're going to use the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And we're going to be driven by Industrial Revolution 4.0 technologies and green economy solutions. And we want to use this opportunity to invite colleagues to come and join us, to provide leadership on those various topics that I've shared with you. And let's see how best we could look at that leadership and take it, take it further. For the period going 2020 to 2050, we're definitely going to be looking at electrical energy. We have to look at electrical energy. There's this, there's this call for a just transition away from carbon. Carbon has got to go to zero. By 2040, it should be heading in the direction of zero. 
by 2050, it's got to be at zero. As I said earlier, the ice is melting. We've seen and experienced the impact of COVID-19 from the health portfolio and the lockdown it's had on us. And my view is that carbon is going to give us a similar lockdown very, very shortly. I don't even think it will get to 2040. By 2030, we're going to be locking down severely in terms of carbon because the environment's changing on us. We've got to look towards uranium for synchronous electrical systems. And again, we can look towards hydrogen, renewable energy, and imported hydro for the asynchronous electrical systems. And we'll take a, take a deeper discussion on what I term synchronous electrical systems and asynchronous electrical systems when we roll out the portfolio on electrical energy, which is a webinar that will follow on this one. And we've got to go back to this issue of security of supply at lowest cost. Dr. McRae said to us, we've got to be a top utility and we've got to provide to the customer electrical energy at the lowest cost. We have to go back to this scenario of secure supply at the lowest cost. We'll explore water security. We'll explore electric transportation. We will explore energy intensive heating, cooling and smelting. We must explore waste beneficiation. Also in the earlier one around mineral and mining resources beneficiation, we must explore beneficiation. If you take the Sishin Saldana uh, investment, you find that all the iron ore that we mine in the, in the Northern Cape, we export it, we give it away. We've got to add heat to it and convert that, not just into exportable raw material, but as an exportable steel, and exportable products that can be further beneficiated in terms of the industrial revolutions that we embrace. We've got to look at food security. And nuclear plays a big part in agricultural production, food processing and beneficiation and food storage. And obviously, there's a huge chapter on medical sciences and medical technologies. And we'll also have a dedicated webinar that's going to focus on the, on the medical side of, of, the, of, the, of the science. For today, we got Prof Cornell who's going to join us and talk about Industrial Revolution 4.0 and big data. And Chairman will, will introduce him shortly. And we've also got Dr. Jean Marie Giuliani who's going to also share with us some of his experiences in terms of energy security. So colleagues, thank you very much for your time this morning and for, for this focus on the nexus of applications. Um, we definitely going to have to get going and uh, start doing some uh, solid studies, some solid publications and start to take forward uh, and provide leadership in terms of South Africa's investment in the uranium economy. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman, and over to you. Unmute yourself, Dave. I knew I made a mistake somewhere. I apologize to the audience. Um, I'm going <laughs> to pass across to Simon Cornell. Um, Simon Cornell is the uh, above. is professor of physics at the University of Johannesburg. His research interests in particle physics, nuclear physics, nuclear energy, material science, quantum physics, high-performance computing, and applied innovation physics. His rating by the South African Nuclear Research Fa Fa Agency (NRF) cites him as having considerable international recognition. So with that, I will now pass you across, having completely made a mistake in that transfer, to um, Simon Cornell. Yeah, so I hope that you see my screen. Uh, thank you very much, Dave and Pat. I'm going to zoom in to 4IR applications and particularly want to talk about 
some positron emission tomography topics. So MinPET, ColPET, MedPET, PolyPET. So we'll see what these are. Basically, PET stands for positron emission tomography. So at its core, you have some radioactive nucleus, and it will beat to decay by emitting a positron, which will slow down in a material, could be a human body, and find an electron, and the positron is the antimatter of the electron they will mutually annihilate. And <clears throat> I've got my pointer here to show you, and then you will get two back-to-back gamma ray photons. You see these back-to-back -back gamma ray photons in this hospital facility here. You would have injected the patient with a radio-labeled sugar or some biomolecule which particularly targets a metabolic function. For example, cancer would grow fast and would metabolize the fastest of all the body of, of um, taking up that particular biomolecule and could have higher concentration of the tracer at the cancer, and then you would visualize the cancer by detecting many such radioactive decay events. And on the right here is a similar example with the brain, uh, emphasizing that you would image function. So if a person listened to music or did something else in particular, then different areas of the brain would be metabolizing in different ways and you would get hot spots and you could study brain function, not only the brain morphology. But I want to start uh, with applying it in a completely new setting, a very disruptive setting. And this is in mining. And I want to take an example of diamond in rock. So you can see a lot of rock here. And one rock contains a diamond. It is locked inside the rock. And this is the extreme case of something with a very, very high value buried in what is essentially waste. It's less than three parts per billion, and you will have an extremely large amount of waste. And actually, the mining techniques lead to something called breakage. We wanted to show you about that as well. So if you wanted to make an impact with sensor-based sorting and 4IR techniques, then diamond mining would be where you would look first. So let's see then. Here is a picture, hope you see, it's Murni Mine in Siberia, Russia. It's very, very big. It's, it's incredible to think he has um, very tall buildings on the edge, barely visible. That's how big this hole is. You, you easily see this hole from space. You can imagine all of the barren rock that had to be crushed in order to find the diamonds. And I want to emphasize this mine is considered mined out. Okay, No more diamonds are coming from it. So this is very, very significant. Planet Earth is yielding up most already of what we think are the diamonds in planet Earth. We're just emerging from coronavirus time, and a lot of the diamond mines are thinking to use 4IR technology, if this could be available, to take the industry out of these coronavirus times. And just to emphasize this point, here are uh, sites on the planet. You can see concentrated in Southern Africa and Siberia, then some in Canada, some in Australia. These are um, so-called kimberlite pipes, ancient volcanoes, which erupted usually 60 million years ago. 6,000 6, of them are known. So this is a geological aerial surveys mostly, mapping out what geologists believe are essentially all such kimberlite pipes on planet Earth. 1% of them are commercially viable, leading to only 60 diamond mines on the planet. You can imagine uh, diamonds are extremely rare. 
And in fact, within some years, we expect half the diamonds to be synthetic because they're being mined out. It's very, very beautiful to have a natural one, but that time is past. Now, I want to emphasize the low nature of the technology for diamond recovery. You can see machines for crushing, and then you can see machines for recovery. So a centrifuge would use the density property of the diamond and a grease table would use the hydrophobic property of the surface. The laps thousands of years ago dragged reindeer skins inverted behind reindeer, a kind of a mobile grease table and harvested diamonds off them. So you can see how old such technologies are, haven't really changed. And then you can see how violent um, this, this crushing, this crushing is very, 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 very uh, violent. So I want to show you uh, an example from uh, the Cullinan some years back. And these are four diamonds which arrived within one minute of each other. And they were recovered when the Cullinan put in X-ray fluorescence recovery machines. That means shining X-rays at a curtain of falling rock. And if there were liberated or exposed diamonds on the crushed rock, they would glow and then pneumatic air would expel that. So after installing sensor-based sorting, they recovered these four diamonds within one minute of each other. Now, normally, you should find one of these every few months. So if you found four within a minute, they could only have come from the same parent stone and been crushed. And then if you look at the faces of these diamonds, you see very aggressive, sheer um, patterns. And you can imagine that these diamonds were crushed. Also, it's not really possible to treat them as a jigsaw puzzle and put together. So in the industry, it's believed that most of the diamond is actually lost in this uh, recovery process. And here's a, another example where there's some quantities attached. You can actually see this diamond on the left fits into the one on the right. And you can see a stippled surface here as if it's not a sheared surface, but here you can see a surface that looks like it was clean. And then looking at a diamond like that, you would imagine where did this breakage happen? Was it in the recovery? Was it when the diamond was brought to the surface? And geologists actually believe it's in the recovery. And then if you look at the size and value of these stones, uh, then you would see about $7 million for them when they were broken and 17 million dollars is the estimate a loss of 10 million dollars if they had not been broken so this is the urgent need in the industry to be able to have a more intelligent or ir sensor based sorting way to recover but they're so beautiful so if you have a look at this this is the color in itself the one side is stipple that we discussed just before as if it were a growth surface with maybe resorption and the other side looks like a shear surface so you can ask yourself the cullinan was 3000 carats or so and how big would it have been if it were not broken and in the state where it is broken you can further ask yourself you know there was internal strain stresses because of the experience it had undergone. And so it had to yield up many smaller stones instead of one big one. Basically, you can say what is out there in nature in terms of diamond, if we could only find them and recover them properly, what large, beautiful, more prolific diamonds would we find? So now we look at the possible plant flow if if we had a mechanism to render the diamonds visible okay and this is positron emission tomography you would have your primary crush 
here where my laser pointer is. And then that primary crush could be something like 160 millimeters diameter and feed into an irradiation popper. And because a diamond's not like a human patient, you can't feed it the radioactivity. You have to produce the radioactivity in the rock. So there's an accelerator beam of photons irradiating the diamond and performing a transmutation of the carbon nucleus inside the diamond. And then it's this irradiation hopper working first out feeds a hold hopper where you wait 30 minutes for most of the activity to die down until only the transmuted 11 carbon, a PET isotope, you could inject a human with it as well, but here it has been created in the rock. Uh, in colloquially, you have heated up the rock, so to speak. And your dominant species is carbon-11, telling you about diamonds in the rock. Here is the back-to-back -back photon emission. You would have a PET detector array, and then you would feed that in some image reconstruction process. Very high performance computing is necessary. Instead of the patient requiring to be inside this detector for some minutes, you're only allowed one second. The rock is moving a thousand tons an hour. And so you'll only see each rock for one second. And then you must make the decision to eject the rock within about three seconds. So you need, again, a huge speed up in this image reconstruction, and then we'll need artificial intelligence for a classification of that rock. Does it or does it not have a diamond and how big, even where? And then you would have some ejection system. Okay, so here's a kind of an image. If there was a diamond in the rock, it would be a hot spot of carbon. There is in fact carbon throughout kimberlite because of carbonates but they are a lower atomic density. And the highest atomic density of carbon is in the diamond. Of course, it's the highest atomic density of carbon you can get. So the diamond is a hot spot of carbon, therefore a hot spot of activation. And these back-to-back -back lines are coming out of it uh, because of this process, which I've explained, and then a sort of a cartoon of the position sensitive detectors is shown. And just a very quick guide, how is reconstruction? Here's reconstruction of a point source. It basically reconstructs itself. There are 1 million of these decays in one second here from this point source. And you see that if you simply take the, the three dimensional histogram, of the voxels as they contain lines from, from these gamma rays, then you will automatically reconstruct the hotspot. Such a thing is known in the industry as a back projection, okay? It's the cheapest reconstruction of a hotspot. Of course, you need more powerful ones, more sophisticated mathematics, but that at least shows you at least for a point source, of activity, it's obvious you will reconstruct it. Now, how does nature like this process? You can see that green is an unactivated kimberlite. It already has radioactivity in, cannot not. It comes from the planet. The planet came from a supernova long ago, so it's already radioactive, and all rock knows about that. So the green is the natural activity of kimberlite, and you see essentially the only difference is this back-to-back -back activity of the PET isotope. And this is uh, after an hour. In fact, the activity is so low after an hour, the rock would no longer be classified as needing regulation by atomic energy uh, regulating authority. And, and in fact, the rock recovers back to its natural state uh, within around an hour, in, indistinguishable practically from it. 
And this is how simple the technique is. This is the first experiment. It was done at Karolinska University. This is a system where they had a gamma knife. They could do cancer treatment on a patient. A patient would lie here. So this rock is our patient. And we attended this university as if we were patients. In fact, that's how we had to access the dean time. They allocated nurses to help us. And, and this, um, this uh, gantry would deliver gamma rays to this rock and activate the carbon 11. And it had a hole drilled in here and was spiked with a diamond. And here you see a three-dimensional picture recovered. So taking that rock after the activation to the hospital's PET facility and produced this image. The hot spot is a diamond. It was also done on another rock with, with a smaller diamond. And I just want to say, if you show a picture like this to a diamond miner, they will go totally nuts. There's no comparable technique that can show a diamond inside a rock like this. Uh, so I want to show you that since then we have developed things a lot. And this is a full dress rehearsal here of carefully uh, uh, created rocks with diamonds put in. Uh, so I just want to show you a few. I'll, I'll go through them quite fast. So this is a 10 centimeter cube and it's got a 12 carat diamond in and it sticks out. This is that same one shown reconstructed in three dimensions. So in, in, it's a three dimensional technique, uh, tomography, and you, you cannot avoid seeing such a big diamond as 12 carats in a 10 centimeter rock. This is the same picture really emphasizing the three-dimensional nature where the slice in the tomographic reconstruction goes through and, and each time you do see the diamond. Now going to a smaller diamond, this is a, about a three carat in the same rock and then you start to see that there's noise. This noise is an artifact of not having an advanced uh, activation system. It wouldn't be there in an in a industry uh, level uh, system. So this is a case where the lab is not as nice as what you would do if you were making it in the field. But again, you see the diamond. And then um, we had a request from the diamond industry. If you were not looking in a kimberlite pipe where, where the rock uh, was soft, but you were looking on alluvial um, deposits, like on the Orange River, where the diamond would be in a calcium carbonate uh, matrix, post matrix. It was the worst case to do MinPET because the activation would activate the calcium, it would activate the oxygen, and would activate the carbon, none of which are from diamond. So everything in the host matrix should become a background and we told them we would not manage to see a diamond in an alluvial rock but they insisted and gave us some of their rock uh, you see now it's uh, white and this was a 15 centimeter one and there you see a 10 carat diamond in their rock but you see a much higher background and this is that same rock then uh, in three dimensions rotating and uh, to our surprise, you still saw the diamond even in the calcium carbonate. I do want to show you a few more. Um, again, um, when you go to a smaller rock, it sticks out more. Um, this, this is a 0.2 carat diamond, 0.2 carat, okay? And it's already still visible. So, um, it's coming to the level of the background, but it's a 0.2 carat diamond. This is a very high symmetry case of circular, and so the five carat diamond sticks out. And, and here is a 18 centimeter rock along this direction with a 22 carat diamond in it, and it sticks out. And here's a kind of a more natural looking rock 
with the one character in and it also uh, sticks out very, very much. Uh, just some other examples. And this picture is just to indicate that um, we have at the moment a size cutoff um, where non-diamonds would be the blue and then bigger and bigger diamonds. And it's at about six millimeters that you have very, very few false positives using an AI to look for a diamond. So the current boundary in a, a um, um, 16, millimeter rock would be about six millimeters diamond. And, and I want to um, say we've had a wonderful um, collaboration with Gem Diamond. So give you something from their annual report to try and stick to public documents. But we have been working uh, with them. Uh, and um, I want to leave the story of recovering diamonds there and move on to coal. So here is a, a coal-fired power station and you would like to know the coal going in in real time. You would like to know calorific value and moisture content. And then the proposal is to take carbon as a proxy for the former and oxygen for the latter. And you would like it to be a real-time process. So this is how you would do it. You would look at the 511 KEB radiation, but instead of a snapshot of one second, as with the diamonds, you, you would look at it over a time window. And as time went on, the strength of that peak would get less, and you would plot that. You would have these curves, and then they would be a, a, a composition of all the different PET isotopes that you had activated, of which uh, oxygen and carbon come early on. And then by having such a, a time differential method, um, you would detect an elemental analysis through a lifetime analysis. So I believe this is not really known that PET becomes an elemental sensitive technique. And then the proposal is that you take off sequentially some coal and put it through a box and then return it. A three kilogram sample every five minutes. And in that box, you would have a scanner to activate the coal. And then you would have a detection system to, to look at the oxygen and carbon content. And in fact, you could do other elements as well. Now, um, moving to positron emission tomography for medicine, the idea is to go beyond a small scanner, which is limited by cost and limited by data rate, as you see here, and have a two meter long scanner. This is, was too complex to occur in the world until uh, last year, about mid last year, there was an experimental project called Explorer, Human Explorer, and these are pictures from it. And Human Explorer is still not a full correlated whole body PET scanner, but already in this more limited uh, incarnation, it was 40 times more efficient, whereby it's proposed that you could either use a 40 times lower dose, which means you could PET scan children, or you could do multiple PET scans, or you could take your factor 40 and say, I'm going to make a PET video and watch something for example, you could decide to watch blood pumping through the heart or whatever you would like to watch and you, you would have a pet video or you could have a longer time variation and watch dynamics as you see uh, uh, over here. So this is thought to be a disruptive medical technology. It's, it's such a huge jump in capacity to visualize function inside the human body that um, it, it's thought it will be disruptive. 
So that's very, very interesting. And, and then uh, the last thing I want to say um, is polypet. Polypet is where you fully use the elemental sensitivity of PET. So here's a three-dimensional plot of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, and different elements, explosives, and narcotics, and various other compounds. And you literally can distinguish them one from another. And such light element sensitivity is very, very difficult. So it could be really very, very good for explosives, narcotics, and plastics. And it could be buried, hidden. So one would have container scanning, one would have landmine recovery, one could have points of entry for homeland security, and so on. So there are endless possibilities to take it further. I just want to say um, the, the incredible thing is the enormous development, just like in your telephone, which, which becomes out of date in, in a few years or, or less. The, the progress in the detectors, the progress in high throughput data, the progress in big data, the progress in artificial intelligence for classification, these make it really begging for an application, polypet, coal pet, med pet, min pet, et cetera. So that's what, um, uh, just a, a zoom in on what we've been working in. And, and here I would just like to thank all the different players who have been, um, on this journey with us and i'll end it there thank you over to you dave thank you very much indeed um i'll just go back got it right okay uh thank you very much indeed i i i, I will have to borrow one of those pet machines to go in my back garden and see if i can find a diamond or two it might help me with my wife um but to move on and uh, we'll take questions at the end of this uh, the session. The, the third um, presentation is is, is by uh, Jean-Marie Julien, um, and he's the co-chair of the study committee. Um, Dr. Julien was born in Mauritius, studied chartered accountancy in the UK, where he did his five years article with Robertson, Rhodes, Lasso, and Dun Dunwoody. Moved to Africa in 79, where he fell in love with the country and its people as MBA from Newport University, California, and a PhD in Management of Technology Innovation from the Da Vinci Institute. He also obtained the Leonardo Da Vinci Award the following year. He's honorary colonel in the regiment, President Kruger, Lenong, and a governor of the Mabarari, I apologize for the pronunciation, Institute of Strategic Reflection, which is a mystery, which is well worth, just digression, it's well worth going looking at their, at their website. They're doing a lot of work on where is the world going. Um, and as such, I will now pass the cross to Jean-Marie to present some examples of a history of a country which embraced nuclear power in a way and the impact on the country. So with that, I'm passing across to Jean-Marie. Hello. Hello. Can you all hear me? <laughs> Hello. I can, John Marie. I trust the rest of the audience can as well. So, can you see the presentation? Not yet. There, yes, it's there. Okay. So, good morning, everyone. And uh, it was very excited to. I was very excited to have heard what you have been saying since this morning. And the PET is really something that. We need to develop more and more. My, my section is to speak about the French experience and the nuclear jobs in the national economy. We all know that uh, the French had a huge problem in the early 70s when the oil prices started to go up and they decided to, to move into the nuclear. France. France has uh, a, a large supply of electricity. 75% of its electricity is from nuclear energy. And um, they are looking at reducing it to 50% by 2035. But 
France is the world's largest net exporter of electricity due, due to the very low cost of generation. They started in the 70s, and um, today they are exporting the electricity to Germany, to Italy, to the neighboring countries, and it's in the region of about 3 billion euro per year. That is going to continue as, as Germany has reduced its generation power from the nuclear. And uh, now we, we, we see that there is a bit of hesitation on, on their part as to where are they going to get their base load of electricity supply. The nuclear plants in France are, are, are shown on the map that we have shared. There are quite a few on, on this map that are still under construction. We know of Flamanville and others, but um, the generation is, is safe, although the plants are sometimes dating back to the 70s. It has altogether, France, 58 nuclear power reactors in operation. It's supplying 63,130 megawatt of electricity and one EPR reactor under construction at Flamanville. It's a large construction and it's got a bit of delays and um, hopefully it will be in, into production in the near future. The nuclear plants of France account for 71.7% of total French electricity generation in 2018. And 90% of France's electricity comes from low carbon sources, nuclear and renewable. The total net export is 39.4 terawatt hours during the period from 1st of January to 30th of December, November 2019. France also has 10 nuclear submarines. Nuclear power allowed submarines to run for about 20 years without needing to be refueled. The latest model that France produced will run for 30 years without refueling. The only limitation on the nuclear submarine time at sea is the food supply to the people on board. It's interesting also to, to, to know that in a submarine, the people who are at, in close proximity to the nuclear plant on board are subjected to less radiation than a normal person working in an office building in town. That's because of the way the nuclear reactors are protected. As I said, why did France go nuclear? At the time of, a, of the oil crisis, electricity came from foreign oil. Nuclear power allowed France to compensate for its lack of indigenous energy resources by applying its strengths in heavy engineering. As I said, there was not a history of, of nuclear this. They just started from scratch. They trained people who were from different parts of employment, whether they were farmers or they were in trade. They were trained into the nuclear field. And today, France is one of the major per, per head it could it, it is a country that has the most nuclear power the united states has the most operational nuclear reactors on the planet 96 compared to france 58 together they have a capacity of 97565 megawatt and last year, nuclear energy made up about 20% of the country's electricity generation. Well, as France, with 58 nuclear reactors, produce 75% of the country's electricity. What I would like to talk now is about the, the small modular reactors, what is called as SMR. Um, the SMRs have been developed 
as you can see, I, I want to play a video and uh, it will be self-explanatory and we can start again once uh, the video has been shown. I think it's, it's, it's a good presentation and would love you to, to share with it. It's taking so long. SMRs. SMRs are the next. Why is it doing it? Why is it doing it? That seems to be the internet. Why is it doing it? It's that. But. SMRs are the next evolution of nuclear energy, a type of nuclear reactor designed to be smaller in size than a traditional reactor. They're based on the same science as larger reactors, using fission to create heat, which can then be used to generate electricity. Small reactors have existed for more than 50 years since the beginning of reactor technology, like the experimental reactor at McMaster University in Hamilton. Interest in SMR technology is growing across the industry and around the world. There are more than 150 proposed designs worldwide. Canada's energy needs are well suited for SMRs as they offer the potential to provide clean, reliable electricity at manageable cost for both on and off grid communities. SMRs have three potential areas of application in Canada. For communities already connected to the electricity grid, SMRs provide a clean and reliable source of electricity to augment the current energy mix, enabling the development of renewable technologies to support environmental and climate change goals. This is particularly useful in provinces focused on lowering their fossil fuel generation. For communities not connected to the grid, particularly in northern remote areas, SM SMRs offer a solution to improve access to reliable electricity generation and reduce dependency on diesel energy. They can support improved health and environmental well-being. Social development and economic benefits. And SMRs can be a significant asset to heavy industry, like oil sands producers and remote mines across the country, who could benefit from the reliable and clean source of heat and power from SMRs. Although the basic science is the same, SMRs are an evolved technology and have advantages that make them beneficial in situations where a larger, grid-connected reactor may not be an option. They're smaller in size, both physically and in their land footprint. They are modular in that they are factory constructed and then delivered to site. In many cases, they are delivered already fueled and can operate for many years on the initial load of fuel. And they have other uses beyond electricity generation. They produce heat that can be easily used for other applications like district heating for commercial or residential needs, hybrid energy systems, water desalination, or heavy industry applications. SMRs can augment the baseload generation from traditional reactors and provide a reliable and diverse energy mix. So we can see that small modular reactors are the future. As we have seen in, in Canada, it's extensively used. And um, there are about 50 SMR designs and concepts globally. In fact, it's more, more than that. I'm, I'm told it's more than 150 designs that are now competing for the market. Most of them are in various development stages, and some are claimed as being nearly near-term deployable. There are currently four SMRs in advanced stages of construction in Argentina, China, and Russia, and several existing and new common nuclear energy countries are conducting SMR research and development. South Africa was a leader and uh, started with a South African pebble bed modular reactor and um, I signed a, a memorandum of understanding with its Chinese counterparts, the Institute of Nuclear and New Energy Technology, and Tsinghua University and the Chinergy Company. INET and Chinergy are also developing PBMR technology. The PBMR 
reactor project entails the building of both a demonstration plant at Kuburg, the site of the country's only existing nuclear reactor unit, and a pebble fuel manufacturing plant at Pelindaba near Pretoria. The schedule was to start construction in 2010 and for, and for demonstration plant to be completed by 2014. We need SMRs, we need, we need the facility to be able to access, to ac for the, our people to access energy. Africa is known as the dark continent only because at night when you fly from Europe over to South Africa, the whole continent is in total darkness. There's no reflection. If you fly over the sea, you see the reflection of the stars and the moon. But when you fly over the continent itself, you see absolutely nothing. It's pitch dark. And uh, pitch dark means no energy. No energy means no ability to go industrial, no ability to bring employment or beneficiation to the huge amount of wealth that is trapped in our continent. South Africa has potential. We need leadership and we need vision so that we can implement what we know is of benefit to our people. Thank you. Thank you, John Wei. Uh, Thank you. Can I, can I speak? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, I, we're now looking for, 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 for questions, if there are any. Um, I certainly find it fascinating uh, to look at the development of poor IR technology. And I let's go to Simon's presentation on the use of computing power to make use of nuclear physics. That's what it comes down to. Theoretical things are now becoming practical, and that's the, the PET process. I also think it's worth just adding a little bit to jean Marie's comment on the renewable side of, SAF, of, of French energy. He made the comment that 71% of their power comes from nuclear power. And a further, he actually, 90% is, is, is low carbon, i.e. nuclear and renewable. I think it's worth bearing in mind that in France, about in the, most of that 20% um, is in fact hydro schemes in the Alps, in the south of France. Uh, the actual yeah. wind and PV is quite a small element. So, um, I, I look at the, um, I'm looking for questions, if anyone's got, got a question to, to put to us, please type it on the system. Um, I, I think I will ask um, uh, Simon a question while we're waiting for questions to come through. Um, and uh, and that basically is a question of the application of PET to diamond mine recovery. How close to being commercial is that at this stage? So we could proceed to a, a pilot plant at a diamond mine. We could also do another scale up test, uh, the technology readiness level is in between four and five, which means he's worked in a lab in full dress rehearsal. That means connecting all those stages in that schematic that I showed you, which is activation and then detection and then reconstruction and then classification have all been connected. And in all the mathematics, it shows that if scaled up, it could be done at a uh, thousand tons per hour with rock of 160 millimeters and found down to a six millimeter diamond and then if you wanted to find smaller diamonds you would have to recrush so so um that's what the mathematics and the lab work shows and then in each and every component of minpec there exists somewhere on the globe an uh, incarnation of it at full scale. So, for example, there is an irradiation facility at full scale. There is a detector at that scale. There is data processing at that scale. So, each and every component uh, in other applications is existing as scaled up. So, all that's really necessary is to integrate what are essentially existing technologies now and put them at a mine. 
And so that's what uh, we would like to do really in the next step is proceed to, to a commercial pilot at a mine. Thank you. Uh, we've got a question, um, which if I, I'll cheat and I'll take it, from Frans van Nieuwen, uh, which is what are the chances of restarting the South African PBMR again? And I'd just like to put some background to that because it's a fascinating question. Um, the first point is that the, 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 the PBMR co company is currently a state-owned company. It still has 100% ownership of the IP developed, uh, and the IP has been maintained in extremely good condition. So if you, you know, it, it has not been lost, it's been maintained actively. Um, I think the key question is, um, South Africa, the DMRE has now issued a request for a, a, a request for information about the potential of new nuclear build. And it's in two portions. One portion talks about, let's call it Kubo type reactors, large classical nuclear reactors, which is probably, in my view, aimed at a potentially a couple of new extra units going on the Kuburg side, push Kuburg up to say 4,000 megawatts, which would support the Western Cape very nicely. Very conventional, very off the shelf. What's really fascinating is the other portion of the RFI talks about um, the status of SMRs, which are explicitly discussed, or modular reactors are discussed in the IRP. Um, now, clearly, the, the current situation is the RFI does not call for PBMR-type reactors, that's high-temperature gas core reactors, as being the only ones that are interesting. But there is a logic which may or may not come off is that if a developer um, internationally, which is already working on PBMR type reactors, was to come forward in that area, I think it's quite credible for there to be a joint, potentially a joint deployment using the technology base in South Africa and the technology base from the other party to restart it. To restart it as a purely South African project essentially requires someone to stand up and write out a check at least a billion dollars to get the project going properly again and it'll take 10 years to get to the stage of having the first prototype running so i think that I, I doubt that, that there was the appetite to restart pbr again it would have been brilliant if in 2003 4 when it was really ready in a sense for the first phase of deployment or alternatively in 2010 to have committed properly to the building of the first plant but that didn't happen and there were no time machines so we are where we are and finance still drive that so i think that the, the issue now is can south africa through the need to replace the current coal fleet of power stations over the next 20 30 years and the need in africa explicitly for small for low carbon cost-effective deployable plow plants which if you think about it puts you into hydro or nuclear because you can't dispatch with renewables um, so you end up a situation that says that the african continent is the one with small grids where you need small plants and therefore the prospect of a south african uh, supported venture deploying small modular reactors both onto the current ESCOM coal station sites to replace them as they decommission and also to deploy into Africa where the grids aren't big enough to support large units I think is very exciting uh, we'll have to see how that comes out but um, restarting the PBMR as it was I think is extremely unlikely um, but it's uh, so and I'm still waiting for another question. I'm going to ask a question of Jean-Marie now. Another question of uh, Jean-Marie. Jean-Marie, they recently moved the phase out, the, the dilution of nuclear from 75 to 50 from 2025, which was the last president's target, to 2035. Is there any discussion in France of what actually is the replacement in a low carbon environment for the current nuclear fleet? <laughs> I don't think anybody has any answers to that yet. I mean, the, the movement has been to go towards renewable energy and um, a lot of money is being spent. I mean, as you know, uh, NG, 
who used to be the biggest gas traders, transporters in, in, uh, in Europe, sold their division to Total. And they have gone a big way into renewable energy, solar and wind. So when we talk about EDF and we talk about uh, the nuclear, which is now under the, the auspices of EDF, we don't really know where it's going. But experiences like Flamanville has been very expensive for, for the country. It has experienced so many setbacks. And uh, a bit like our Medupi and Kusile, the cost escalations has been great. And um, as I said, the, the small modular reactors are going to take a bigger space, I think, even in France, as we, as we see that the United States has itself uh, more than 100 nuclear reactors in, in, in submarines and in aircraft carriers. This kind of technology is advancing at a great space, and I think that's where we are going to be leading towards. Thanks. Okay, yeah. I just put another comment, and I'm, I'm going to suggest that Anas uh, to answer the question, I'll put another comment which may be interesting for the, for the uh, listeners webinar. The Saturn government put out a request for proposals in the last few days for 2,000 megawatts of emergency power to reduce the reliance on open cycle diesel fired gas turbines. Um, and what is interesting is it's the first request for proposal uh, from not a technology base, in other words, we want to put in wind or solar or whatever it is, but from a, a, a um, a requirement space of we want power and it explicitly says it must be dispatchable and it must provide other services to the grid operator they require like um, grid stability management and I think what is actually fascinating about that RFP is it's the first RFP that's been put out without saying what technology it's put the constraints on the technology in terms of it must deliver what the customer wants and I suspect yeah. that one of the problems that's going to come from that is that you actually are not going to be able to bid PV or wind against that request for proposals because they aren't dispatchable and they don't provide the um, what's called ancillary services into the grid. So it'd be interesting to see what comes from that. But with that, um, I think it's been very interesting and I want to thank the three um, uh, presenters. And that's Pat Naidu, who is the chairman, the co-chair of the uh, Nexus uh, work study group. Uh, Simon Cannell, who's doing really fundamental work in 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 in, in this in, in, in measurements in this PET processes, and um, Jean Marie, who is I think I'd argue is the intellectual among us, who actually is thinking about the philosophy of life, other than us poor little engineers. <laughs> Um, and with that, I would like to close. Thank you for attending the, the technical talk today. Um, and please go to the SAI website. That's www.saiee.org.za. Oh, some more questions. Um, and um, I would look forward to you attending the next one. So with that, I am going to close the, the uh, and thank you all. Please enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.